Hey everybody, welcome back to TNA Talk, or if this is your first time joining, welcome to TNA Talk. In today's episode, we will be having an anonymous person join us. Now, the person we interviewed decided to stay anonymous, she, her pronouns. She decided to stay anonymous and she wants to go by Roxy because she does not want her real name out in the world. So I hope you guys enjoy this podcast and just be aware that her voice has been changed as well as her name has been blurred out and anybody else's names that she mentions or information that she believes will lead back to her. Thank you, and enjoy today's podcast. Hi, I'm... A lot of people call me Roxy. I prefer Roxy a lot of the time. Um, I was born and raised in Brooklyn, moved to Jersey. When I was seven, um, I am a recovering alcoholic and a suicide survivor. I also am a recovering pill taker. I used to take pills. Um, When I was about 12, I was raped by somebody who was supposed to be my grandfather. Um, Kind of been living with it, the consequences for it every single day. So, after a while, I changed my name because I felt like I didn't want no attachments to like the person who I used to be. Um, I'm 17. When I was 13, I started drinking. Um, mostly just body stuff I was found in cabinets, but I was a really heavy drinker. I started drinking when I started going through things like depression because of my rape. Um, the person who was supposed to be my grandfather started to molest me when I turned 12 because my grandmother died and he was so called lonely. Um, I went to go tell somebody about it and they didn't believe me. Then afterwards, it happened again, but this time to my sisters. Their names will not be shown. Um, my sister ended up getting raped by the same man, and they ended up kicking him out. After that happened, I kind of felt like I was the one no one would be leaving for. So I started like drinking heavily, just trying to cover the pain and stuff. I always felt like, you know, it kind of helped me cope with what I was feeling, especially because a lot of the time I always felt dirty and unwanted, just mess, a mess overall. When I turned 15, I was dealing with a lot of stuff, like still coping with my grandmother's dad, because she was like a mom to me. And she always took care of me and sit like that when nobody else did. So I was still coping with that. And I was coping with the fact that her death caused my rape. Because I had nobody to speak to, especially when I was younger. Because it was always this rule in my house. What happens in the house stays in the house. So... I was never allowed to, like, talk to people about stuff that happened with me. I was always told to, like, keep it to myself and, you know, not share it with anybody because it was embarrassing. Now that I'm older, I got heavily into smoking. We, I haven't stopped, but it's one of the other things that helps me cope. I kind of have these moods where... I will go blank for very long periods of time. Um, it's like, it's like being really, really sad, but you're so sad to the point where it lasts months. Sometimes it's like you can't even move. It feels like somebody just kind of stops your life. Everything's moving around you. You just don't, you don't feel a part of anything. Um, oh my god, sorry, um, 
I started to um a farm, which was just me either cutting or burning myself. Um, I used to take like these needles and like stab myself with them all around my thighs and stuff. It's just kind of because I didn't like my skin or my body, mostly because that's what I felt. I could always feel like the person who raped me, hands on me, and I could smell them on me. So it was really hard for me to like stay in my own skin. So I started to hurt myself a lot. Just to make me like feel better, so like it was somebody to blame. Um, when I started getting into like really depressive thoughts and stuff, on January 2nd of 2020, 21, 2021, I ended up trying to commit suicide. I overdosed on pills that I had in my mom's bathroom. I had to end up going to the hospital and getting my stomach pumped. I came back, I was alive, like, you know, I, I survived. Afterwards, I started working on myself. I wrote a book called Medusa, which is basically about a girl whose rape made her, you know, affected her love life. Medusa is a, hold on. Because I actually have the intro, and I'm about to read it to you guys so you know what the book is about. Go right ahead. It's just the intro, though. Okay. The book I wrote is an anonymous story. It's called Medusa's Love Story. Medusa's Love Story is a story about a girl who goes through Med goes by Medusa and her diary to explain her tragic love life and the horrors from her past. That seems to affect her everyday life. Throughout this book, Medusa shares her experience as a ice victim and how it affects her ability to love correctly. Each chapter is another experience in Medusa's life. Medusa tries her best to explain why she thinks things happen the way they do and how she deals with it. This book involves four stories of tragic love loss and one story about the misfit of her body. Okay, that's it. That's, that's Medusa's love story. I wrote Medusa's love story to make me feel better about what happened to me. To make it feel like someone heard me. Someone heard my story. I've always wanted to publish it, but it was never fully complete. Because of the fact that in January 2022, I lost my best friend. Her name was... I stopped writing my book when I stopped talking because she was an important part of my life and she was part of the reason I was motivated to write. I loved her because I was doing dumb shit and so was the wrong person. After I lost, I went to a really deep depression where I started to self-sabotage. I was in a good relationship, but I did bad things to myself, such as drugs, etc. Um. I stopped writing because she was the one who inspired me to speak about what happened to me. Then, I guess you can say maybe six months ago, I met a boy who encouraged me to write about my story again. He ended up moving away to Connecticut, but he was kind of a really big part of my life. And here I am now, today, with a book unpublished, but almost finished. And I'm a recovering alcoholic. I've been, like, two months, three months sober off alcohol. Only alcohol, though, I'm still doing weed. And two years clean off of pills. And six months off of cell phones. So, last year, I had a miscarriage. It was with a boy I've been with for almost a year and a half now. Um, I ended up getting pregnant by him. And I ended up falling down the flight of stairs on my stomach. And when this happened, I ended up losing the baby. 
Also due to stress, I had to go to Brooklyn and use my aunt's insurance to go to the doctor and they told me that I was already three months pregnant. I lost the baby. When you had the miscarriage, did it affect your um habits? Did it like make your addiction try to come back like with drinking or smoking or anything? Um, no, because of the fact that I just didn't feel like I needed that. I more mm-hmm. so started to like self harm and stuff, but I never went back to alcohol. I guess it was because I still had <laughs> which was the boy who you know, the father of the baby. I still mm-hmm. had him in my life, so I still had something to live for. But there was still something missing, so I did start to have self-harm again for a short period of time, but I never went back to alcohol. Instead, I just started smoking marijuana heavy. All right. Um, With self-harm, is this something that you still, like, struggle with? Or, like, because even if you're sober, you know, I still struggle with this sometimes, too, where... You still get that urge, like you want to do it when something happens? I do. Usually, if I feel like I'm about to surf farm again, I will either cut my hair, dye my hair. Um, I'll just try to find ways to distract alcohol on my best friend. Or I'll just, like, play my game or talk to <laughs> who's also currently still in my life. It's a complicated situation. Understandable, especially with everything that happened. I get that. I also have this space in my closet. Mm-hmm. I go in there sometimes with like a radio and I'll play music and I'll just sit there for like hours until like I fall asleep and forget about it. Do you think that um, your any like self harm habits will come back anytime soon? Because you seem like you're doing very well with that and you found other ways to cope do you think that it'll stop for a while or will you do you think that you'll slip up and go back to it and if yes would you need support just in case usually i can't tell the future feel me like and i don't try to even though i'm clean with the cell phone and i have been for a while now i know there's a possibility that i'll break i have come close to it especially recently but i do have a care system and a nice and then how do you say um i have good people behind me a good support and, system yeah <clears throat> in case those things happen now and i have my best friend which is also my sister um i have a good support system i depend on them a lot which actually takes a lot for me because i'm not good at that but they they kind of help me stay clean. Uh, maybe there will be a day that I slip up again, but I don't go. I try my best not to. Okay, that's good. And I also feel like I don't want to say, no, I'll never do it again because of the fact that, you know, I don't want to jinx it. So... You know. <clears throat> Does anybody else have any questions? I have a lot, but I feel like I'm asking too much already. No, I, I have a few questions, but Alex, if you want to keep going, you can. No, go ahead. Cut me off. I talk too much. So I, pr- I pretty much wrote down almost everything you said. So the first thing I want to ask you, if you're comfortable with talking about this, when you brought it up, your situation of getting raped, why didn't anybody believe you? And, like, is there a reason behind that? Um, my mother always kind of thought that I was the dramatic one. I always used to, like, you know, be the least favorite and all of that. So everybody always thought that I did things for attention, that I was an attention seeker in my family. So when I said it, it was like, he just holds attention. She's, she's not, she's not telling the truth. When it happened, my sister, who was her favorite child at the time, they believed her off the bat because they, that was their favorite child. So when they believed your sister when she got raped, 
did you lash out on them? Did you say anything about it? I ran away. And how long so, were you gone for? Three days. But I was in a friend's house, so I was completely safe. But the friend let me stay there for three days, and then I had to go back home because they called the ATS on my mom. Did the uh, DCF getting called affect you in any way? Um, not really. They did an inspection on my house, and they saw my mom and my father as fit parents. So they didn't remove me or anything. Um, I went to therapy for four months, but the therapist ended up doing something that kind of made me feel worse. So I stopped going to therapy, and I ended up going back on therapy. Would you ever consider going to therapy again or because of the situation, are you uncomfortable with going back? I've had a good therapist last year. I was forced to go to her therapy though because I ended up getting um, brought into a hospital because I had sliced a vein in my arm and almost died. But she, she was actually a pretty good therapist. She did help me a lot. But I don't think I would go to anyone else besides her only because it's hard for me to trust people. If I do try therapy again, though, I definitely will, like, document how it goes for me. I definitely recommend that, writing down every single one of your sessions. Also, um, was there a reason why you were not allowed to speak of your rape situation? So because of the fact that my family was, like, really embarrassed, that it happened to me first and they didn't believe me. Um, they just kind of asked me not to speak about it. They have been trying to like kind of make up for the fact that they didn't believe me. But, you know, it happened. So where is your grandpa at now in your life, in your family's life? He lives, I know exactly where he lives. He lives in my old um neighborhood. And he's just kind of living life. Nobody ever like took him to court or anything he ended up raping his daughter and she tried to take him to court but they didn't have enough money for a lawyer so they ended up dropping the case that's horrible a free man and he still kind of stalks me on tiktok too if Ugh. you had the chance to report him and go into legal stuff you could get like um a lawyer i know there's a lawyer in new york a couple of them um, who my family has dealt with as well, where they don't get paid unless they win the case, which is very good because if you lose, they don't get paid a dime. Um, you can get a lawyer like that. If you were to report them, would you feel comfortable doing that? Reporting what he did to you and your family and to his daughter? I, I only wouldn't do it because of the fact that he was the last thing I had of my grandmother. Mm. And for some reason... I can't see myself putting him beyond bars. Out of respect for your grandmother? That and because we're talking about a person who I actually raised in a way. Like, I don't know. I don't even think I would be able to stand in court and see his face. I might break down. That's fair. So before uh, your grandma passed away, was your grandfather doing anything to you? Did you see any signs of him being you know, weird sexually and touching you, know, you and that's, things like that's that? The, that's the thing. He was, before my grandmother died, he was amazing to me. He helped her raise me. He helped her get me out of apartments. Like, he, the shelter, he helped my parents get out the shelter. He was amazing before my grandmother died. So your book, are you still working on that? And do you think you have an official date where it may be ready to be put out? Or are you not sure yet? I'm actually finished with the book. The book is pretty short, which I don't know how to... Like, the book is short. So I don't know if I should publish it now with it being short because I don't know if people are going to read such a short story. But I don't know. I'm kind of thinking of um, trying to publish it, get someone to publish it by the end of the summertime, this summer coming up, or mm -hmm. by the beginning of the, or by the end of the school year. I do want to have it published. 
So when you almost uh, died due to the overdose, was there any um, bad mindsets you had after that? Were you feeling any type of way? Did your mind feel like it was changing or going through stuff? I kind of just fell into depression. I didn't shower for like two months. I stood in my room all the time, didn't eat. Um, it was so bad that I ended up having to get rushed to the hospital because I wasn't eating at all, like, or drinking anything. I was just in my room. So I ended up being rushed to the hospital. They had to give me like a feeding tube, hold me over yeah. now. I like, it was weird. It was a lot though, because it was like everybody around me was like trying to push me to move forward. And it was just like I was stuck in this one place that I didn't want to move from. So um, it was very difficult for me. But the once they got me in the hospital, I started force feeding me and stuff. I kind of learned to let go. You know? Understandable. Yep. Did you have any support people that you would be able to talk to what was happening? Like, whether it was the self-harm or the addiction or the, the sexual assault and rape? Or did you have anyone you could confide in or were you too afraid? At the time, the only one that I ever thought of confiding in was my grandmother and she was dead. So... Mm. It was just me. It was me and my own thoughts. Is Do you think that what affected it even more, making it worse? Being, having no one to talk to, yes. Because it felt like, okay, it's like having a thousand things happen in your head and you can't talk about nothing. It's like being mute for a day. Nobody can hear you. It's like being trapped in a room where nobody can hear you. That's exactly what it's like. It's like it's like being in prison by yourself. So it's kind of like being a mime. You can't speak. You can only move. Yeah. And sometimes not even that. I mean, I would wake up just feeling like I didn't want to, like, I didn't want, it kind of felt like, like, you couldn't move a muscle in your body. Mm. It's like being paralyzed. You were so sad that you just stood there and waited for time to go by. Did that time period feel like a dream, like a fever dream, like something that doesn't even feel real now, but it still affects you to your day-to-day -day life? I don't think it will ever be like a dream to me. To me, it's currently still my reality. I'm is it something right. that plays over at night? Yeah. The moment I'm alone, that darkness comes back. It doesn't stay away. But I have to be the one to, I have to fight it. And with my support team and with everything that I have around me, it's been a little easier to fight it. But that darkness will never fade. It's always going to be in my life. It's always going to be there waiting for me to crumble. I just hope that I don't. I wake up every day hoping that I don't crumble. Is there any support system that you have now that you think that will help you? I have my best friends and I have my, I guess you can say sort of boyfriend or ex-boyfriend. And mm -hmm. I have my parents sometimes now they're, they're like very, they're like a light switch, but I have them when I need it. And I have my games and my writing and my music. If we were able to set up something where, free of charge, of course, since we're a nonprofit, a therapy session once a week or whenever you would need, would you be down for something like that? I don't mind. You didn't? I don't mind. I just okay. hope the person knows that it might take me a while to open up. No, of course. If anything, it, it could be somebody that is a staff, since, you know, you told us your story and we have a feeling, you know, we know a little bit about your situation now. I would, um, the only thing is I would want it to be someone who doesn't directly know me. Of course. We can work something out with that. 
Um, is there a way that you, is there like um, something that you don't exactly know how to explain like in your life right now that you want to talk about, but don't know how to put it into words? Kind of like right now, the thing that I'm going through right now is kind of, I'm, I'm, I could, I have a lot going on, right? I have to start finding a school and even though I found one, I'm supposed to be attending Renaissance stuff. So I'm also like currently trying to find a way to make money and stuff like that and I'm dealing with my parents going through money issues. I'm having this moment where I feel like everything I do is not enough. It's like mm. I'm always letting someone down. Like I'm always. Oh, oh sorry. Keep going. <laughs> so I have like a lot of moments where I feel like, you know, nothing I do is right. So, you know, a lot of the time, I just kind of wish I could disappear, like into midair, just go somewhere and never look back and just disappear. I feel like I hurt people less when I'm not around them. I, I don't hurt the people I love when I'm gone. And that's Just, kind of that's kind of the feeling that I've been having lately, that I've been fighting so hard. The last time I had this feeling, I ran away. Like, literally ran away. I ran away a couple times. But I ran away and I was gone for like three days. And I missed up all of that. I was high all the time, all of that. I know if I do disappear, I'm going to hurt myself. I know if I disappear, I'm going to destroy myself. But then I know that if I stay and I try, there's a chance that there's always going to be someone that I don't, I, I don't do right by. It's like I move 10 steps forward and then move 50 back. I'll be doing good for a long period of time. And then something will just switch in me. And it's like I'd be kicked back. It's like air in my chest all the time because it's like I'm always waiting for the moment somebody tells me I'm not enough or somebody tells me that I've made a mistake again. You know? It's just always that feeling like I'm going to hurt somebody. So going back to the financial issues that you were talking about a little while ago. Um, so, since our group wants to start working on more of, like, charity and foundation stuff, did you want us to possibly help you and your family set up a GoFundMe? No, my family doesn't accept help. Okay, we're just making sure, because I know you brought it up, and I know a lot of people struggle with that stuff, so we weren't sure. The financial thing, the financial thing is more so for me. I want to move out of the house that I'm in now currently because it feels like I'm in the same walls every day with the same type of people. So reflecting back to the GoFundMe thing, did you want any help from anybody whatsoever? I don't like help. Okay. Especially not money-wise. What about but, if we offered, we found and offered some jobs that could b help you? Like whether it's catering, because like catering, exactly, exactly. babysitting, stuff like that. Exactly. That that will work. Trust me, from a waitress, uh, if you do waitressing, you make a lot of tips. It's a really good job. So if you want, I can look at stuff like that in your area. Yes, I like that. Also, I with transportation-wise, do you have any trouble getting places? As long as it's in New Jersey, Jersey City, Hoboken, whatever. As long as it's like in my area, I can travel. Okay, that sounds good. I'll start looking into those for you guys. Okay. Um, I have um a couple questions regarding um your financial situation and just your you know overall emotion right now. How are you feeling currently? Like after explaining your story, do you feel a sense of relief or do you still feel kind of trapped? I kind of feel like relieved. This is the first time that people actually listen. And, like, understand what I've gone through. Do you think that when this podcast is posted, do you think people will understand you as well now? Will you feel like you're helping others by telling your story and letting them know that they're not alone? I hope so. I mean, I want to know if there's a purpose to all my pain. If I can help somebody because they understand what I went through, 
at least I know there was a reason I went through it, you know? Do you I'm feel like a, everything that you went through makes you a bigger person today? No. I feel like I've always been that person who wants to help and love and, you know, be better. I've always been that person despite what I've gone through. But what I've gone through has helped me show people that, you know, has helped people understand why I do what I do. But it it has not made me a certain person a certain way. I did that on my own. I like to believe that it wasn't my pain who made me the person that I am. I like to believe that I am just that person, you know? Do you think that your pain is what defined you for a lot of your years before you were able to find your own path? Yes. Everything everything had to go according to what I was comfortable with because of what I went through. Mm -hmm. I was able to do things because I didn't feel comfortable because of my pain. Feel me? Like everything I went through stopped me from doing a lot. When I finally started to get comfortable with what happened to me and comfortable with all the stuff that I thought I would never do again. And, you know, I started to believe like, hey, even though this happened, I can still be me. When I started to actually believe and try to understand that, I started to do, I started to live my own life. You know, my, my, my pain didn't define me and what I do in the future anymore. It just helped me through it. It just helped me help other people. But I don't think that I would have been able to help people as much as I can now because of my pain. My pain it makes me be able to understand people a lot. It gives me a different window to look from. Going to your um, coping mechanisms, right? Um, do you have any coping mechanisms that are healthy? Because I know that you said currently smoking is a coping mechanism that you use. Do you think that you would be able to, um, soon enough find something that's healthier and that would help you more? I like to do hair. Do you think you could turn cosmetology into a business or a job? I do. It's just, you know, I don't know because a lot of people, you know, they want, they want, um, how you say, I, I don't know how to explain it. Free services? I'm like, yeah, it's hard. It's hard to create a business in this world, you know? It's That's like, not, and especially because I don't know how to do everything. Like, I know certain hairstyles. I can flat iron hair. I can do installs. I can do all of that, but I can't do, like, box braids and shit like that. So I'm, I'm I'm debating because, you know, a lot of people are not going to, I feel like a lot of people are not going to like myself. They're not going to buy myself. Well, I mean, you got to start somewhere, you know. You can make the, you know, start a business with cosmetology. And when you when you you have availability, there's night classes in Jersey City that are like $10 for, I think you get the first three classes free and then it's like $10 each class. And they can mm -hmm. teach you how to do certain hairs and you can learn techniques and there's there there's specifics if you want to do like just braids or if you want to become a male barber. They have that here. Would you ever consider a trade school? Because I know trade schools can help you get into a really, really good business. That's true. I've never thought about it. I've already thought about studying law. Would you do law and then do cosmetology on the side so that you have two career paths set? Kind of like a small business. Yeah. Yeah. I would do anything. I mean, that's a great thing to have, you know, like a plan set in action. Even though you're going through a lot of things, you know, you you still have your mindset where it's like you're going to go to college or, or go to school for law. You're going to continue in that and you want to do cosmetology on the side. and you're trying to find an outlook and an outreach for yourself. And, you know, you know, you're trying to move out. You're trying to do all these good things for yourself. And that's somewhere a lot of people don't get. I know there are people who don't even make it to 17, 16 years old. And there are also others who are like, 
now 24 or in their 30s and they're still living with their parents and you know still going through that that sort of depression and you know it, it's very nice to see a, a younger person who's going through a lot and a lot more than a lot of younger kids go through be able to find an outreach outside of their problems especially because like for me it, it started so young i want to show girls and boys that you know you can go through things as a kid and still make it somewhere you can still, you can still live. Like, I didn't think I was going to make it to 16. I didn't think I was going to make it to 15, to be honest. I was at 14 thinking about killing myself and 13. I didn't think I was going to make it this far, but I did. And I want to show people that that's possible. I had a hard life. No, I was no easy peasy. Yes, I didn't have, yes, I know people had a worse, but like I said, I want to show people that no matter what you've been through, you can you can get somewhere. You can do something with yourself. You know, you don't have to stay in the same hole all the time. It might not get better, but it won't get worse. You can make it. You can make it tolerable. You can make. You can make a. It can, you can make it better. You know, you could. You could do something or become something or just you know like. You can. You can strive even if you've been hurt before. That's what I want to show people. And I'm hoping I do. I'm hoping with this program and what, I, what I'm doing and, you know, the people around me, especially like my sisters and stuff, I want to show them that even though you go through something, you can make it, a, you can make a, a life. You don't have to be in the same loophole all the time, you know? I agree with that. I really like that, actually. If you could tell your siblings something, you know, your sisters or um, in general, your siblings or your parents something like about your life and about how you are in a in simple or even if it's like kind of hard for them to understand. If you were able to sit them down and try to talk to them and tell them everything, what what's one big thing you would want them to take out of your story and what you've gone through? I tell, I tell them to, to, I don't know. I think I tell them to live. I tell them to keep going. Like, there's so many times where I could have just stopped. I don't want that for them. I want them to keep going no matter what life throws at them. To keep living life to the fullest. I want them to really take in life. Because with all the bad and the misfortune and all of that, there's some really beautiful shit that happens in this world. I want them to take that in. I don't want them to take that for granted just because they have a few flaws in the world, you know? I want them to take the good with the bad and I just consume the bad and become it. I consumed the bad and I became it because I allowed it to take over me. And I don't want that for them. I want them to consume the good and let the bad go. You know, I want them to consume the good in life. The bad might happen once in a while, but you can choose whether to let it control you or to prosper from it. And I want them to learn to prosper no matter what. My sisters, my brother, they're my life. And they're everything to me. The only thing I want them to know is that you can prosper from anything. And as long as you don't let the bad take over you, you can make good out of what this, what this world has to offer you. And that's it. That's honestly adorable. I love that. Me too. I, I was about to cry. If you don't want me asking, you know, I already know the answer, but how old is your little brother? My little brother is five years old. If he was to go through anything that you went through, would, would you do what your parents did and kind of like, shove him off and tell him that he's doing for attention or would you be there for him and offer him a helping hand i'd kill the world for my brother that little boy will never have to deal with what i dealt with 
That so boy, like, you're his guardian angel. That boy is my ain't my everything. I got that boy tattooed on my arm. <laughs> oh. I kill for him. He could say something, and everybody could say it's not true, and I'd be the first one to stand in front of him, and I take on the world for that boy. Suit and armor, no questions asked. That boy will never have to go through anything alone. He will never have to worry about somebody not believing him because I will always believe him. The same thing for both my sisters. My sisters could be conquering the world by themselves and they would have me by their side. Do you think that because of everything you went through, your siblings are more important to you than yourself sometimes? Yes, but at the same time, it's not only that. I have, you... like, this motherly instinct now. Mm -hmm. And I think the only people who actually listened to me was my sisters and my brother at the time. My brother wasn't born yet, but he's innocent. He doesn't deserve to see the bad in this world, not yet. And even if he does see the bad in this world, I want him to know that he has somebody behind him. My sisters, on the other hand, through the whole thing, they listened to me. They believed me. One of my sisters is battling depression. Both of my sisters, actually. And both of my sisters are going through the same thing I did because the same thing happened to both of them by the same person. Do they cope the way that you did once everything happened to you? Do they deal with any drinking problems, smoking problems, anything like that? One of my sisters does. She smokes. The other one used to smoke. But the other one found her cope, her, her way through drawing, singing, and her boyfriend, who's been her boyfriend for almost three years now. Oh, wow. Yeah. My little sister, she... um. He smoked a lot, but he also finds her way of coping through music, and he loves to draw. She loves to draw, she can cut hair, she can do anything, and she loves basketball, and she talks to me. That's her coping. Now that I, like, you explain, I feel like your guys' coping mechanisms kind of connect. Do you guys try to do stuff together like cutting sometimes, hair together sometimes is it yes sometimes no like me and my sisters we have to deal with a lot so we stick together and shit like that yeah we do stuff together and stuff but there's also times where all of us are too busy for each other so we try to just you know keep it that way we argue a lot and shit but my sisters are my everything so we always try to do stuff together sometimes when we get the chance. I have a question, and it may be a little, um, it might hit home, so you don't have to answer if you don't want to, but do you think that the reason why you have, like, kind of like a mother figure and, like, a barrier over people like that is because of your miscarriage? Do you feel like that kind of made you more into a mother than you were before because you don't want anybody going through what you did? Honestly, I always, like, had that motherly instinct. I always wanted to be a mother. Mm. I recently got diagnosed with PCOS, which means I it's like a slim chance that I can have a baby. It's very unlikely for me. But... My miscarriage was proof that that's still an option for me. Um, Before that, I've always wanted to be a mom. I had names picked out for my future baby and everything. I've had baby alive all over the place. I've always wanted to be a mom. When I got to hear, you know, when I thought I was pregnant and I, I thought I was going to have a baby, yes, I was scared because I was young, and I'm still young. Yes, I was scared, but it was something I always wanted. So it kind of just kicked in for me. 
Then when I lost her, I reflected it on my little sister, which is kind of a bad thing, but not really. Like, I became her mom. Everything was, she wanted it, she needs it, she has it. And it just kicked in for me. She still deals with it to this day where I want to, like, I start being motherly and she has to tell me to back off, you know? Like, it's, it's just something that naturally happened to me. It's something I always wanted. And when I got it and lost it, it naturally just kicked into place. My little sister is my heaven sent daughter. If that makes sense. My little brother, the same thing. They're what I lost. I'm making up for the baby I lost with those two. I wasn't able to protect her, but I can protect them. If you were I can to have, be there for them. Um, If you were to have another child, do you feel like you would resent it because of your first child not being able to conceive? No. Or do you feel like you would if love it more? If I was to have another child, I feel like it would be my child. The same one that I lost, just at a different time. I would always say that my God, I would, I would call, I would say that God sent my daughter back to me, or my son back to me. It would be them, just at a later time. I feel like it maybe, I always tell myself this, maybe God gave my baby, took my baby home because it was too early. She's going to be with me one day, whether my PC, even if my PCS, PCOS doesn't allow me to have a baby, if I adopt one, or if I do surrogacy or whatever, it's still going to be my baby. I'm still going to love it and cherish it as much as I did the first. So. Had, do you have anything else you would like to say? Like. A message to anyone or to yourself or a reminder, anything like that in general? Be ourselves. Talk to people. Love people. Never find hatred in a human being. Even if it's somebody who deserves it. Because eventually you're going to need somebody to see past your flaws. So. You know, no matter what bad happens, always see love in people, always see love in the world. Because at some point you're going to meet or you're going to feel that love come back to you. Always be positive. And always try to help people out. It does better for your soul at the end of the day. It purifies you. And that's it, really. Ready? One love superwoman that is a rap and zoo. Bye, guys. <laughs>